get started, I just want to mention I was uh, in the ABC store today, and they did have a, a few of my books on Revelation. If you are interested in any of those, uh, you may want to check that out. But I was especially delighted to see that they had quite a collection of the Revelation Hope videos. And uh, Graham Bradford, an Australian evangelist, myself and my wife, uh, together did a series of 24 meetings, hours, uh, studio-based, and uh, did the entire book of Revelation. Uh, so if any of you would be interested in that, check it out. I don't know what they're charging for it, but I have the feeling it's probably less than you would expect. So uh, you may want to check that out, just so you're aware of it. I was not aware of it until today, so I thought I would uh, share that with you. Tonight, I promised that we would be forging ahead in the sense of just sort of taking a look at the world as it is today in the light of the studies we've been doing the last three nights and asking the question, how could the remnant of Revelation make a difference in this world that may be bigger, more surprising, uh, more international than anything we might have dreamed? And so tonight what I want to do, and this is my thing, okay, it's my suggestion. You don't have to buy any of this. It's not based directly on scripture. It is simply looking at today's world through the eyes of someone who has done a lot of work in the non-Christian parts of the world and uh, interacted with a lot of people from a lot of various backgrounds and just observing the politics observing the dynamics around the world. And I've come to an exciting conviction, call it a vision if you wish, of what God could do with the end time remnant of revelation in the days that lie just ahead. So as we're forging ahead, it's good to have a vision. And I want to share my vision tonight, and I'll be fascinated to know uh, how you would respond to such a vision. So I've titled it, A Remnant Rewrite of History. And once again, if you want to forge ahead, you want to be anchored in where you've been and have a strong sense of what God has been doing in this world. So yesterday we talked about the remnant in Scripture and saw that there were multiple remnants that at any point in time you could look in the past and identify historical remnants of various types. You could identify faithful remnants, maybe not identify, but be aware that in every era, God will have faithful ones within historical remnants. But most exciting of all, looking to the future, that God always has something bigger in mind than we imagined. And tonight I want to share what might that something bigger look like. So summarizing what we did yesterday, we learned that there was more than one remnant in Scripture and history, that God has worked with many remnants through history, and uh, some of them have been named in Scripture, others hinted at. But we also learned that there's no guarantee for historical remnants, even if you're part of one of those remnants that God has chosen through the ages, even if you're part of the end time remnant of revelation, it's no guarantee of personal salvation. It's no guarantee that we will remain faithful. But what counts is faithfulness to the message and the mission that God has placed among us. Less than 200 years ago, God did some mighty things with the early Advent peoples. And we honor those things. We're grateful to be part of that movement. But what counts today is faithfulness to the original message, the original mission of that remnant. And there's the sense that something way bigger is coming. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. But let me start by taking you on a 
quick journey through Christian history. And I have something very exciting to report, and that is that in recent years, more and more church historians have been sounding like the book Great Controversy. For many years, Adventists have talked about history, but it's a history that many of the great historians might not have recognized. And interestingly enough, today, some of the top historians in the world are beginning to sound like the story of Great Controversy. Let me share uh, a few of those. And uh, these are all individuals that I know personally and that are regarded at the very top of the historical field in their areas. The first of these is a man named James Dunn. He is a British evangelical. He's no Seventh-day Adventist. But he wrote, uh, he's probably the world's leading expert on first century Christianity. In other words, what was Christianity like in the years immediately after Jesus and his disciples? And he wrote a book called The Partings of the Ways between Christianity and Judaism and their significance for the, for the character of Christianity. So he said this, that in the beginning, Christianity and Judaism were one faith. For example, they worshiped the same God. They read the same scriptures. They worshiped in the same temple. They were one people. So Christianity emerged from within Judaism. And putting this another way, Jesus did not come to start a new religion. Jesus came to reform the religion that was already there. And so as Christianity begins, it begins within Judaism, two parts of one whole. But Dunn points out that very early Christianity and Judaism began to split apart and that that had huge implications for the character of Christianity. This split began in the first century already, in the 50 or 60 years after the death and ascension of Jesus. The decisive period was from 70 to 135 uh, uh, of the dates uh, that we are familiar with today. And by the end of that period, Christianity and Judaism had split apart. And a point that Dunn makes is that when religions break apart, they tend to both lose something. And it was almost as if around 100 AD, representatives of Judaism and Christianity sat down at a table and said, since we're splitting up, let's decide who inherits what. And the Jews said to the Christians, we love the Messiah, but every time we talk about Messiah, people think we're Christians, and we can't have that, so you keep the Messiah. And the Christians said to the Jews, well, we love the Sabbath, but every time we worship on Sabbath, people think we're Jews, and we can't have that, so you keep the Sabbath. And the Jews said to the Christians, we love eschatology. We love thinking about the end of the world. But every time we start doing that, the Romans come and they slap us upside the head in terrible ways. And, and we're tired of that. So you keep the eschatology. And the Christians said to the Jews, you know, we love the Old Testament. It's sort of the foundation of our faith. But every time we teach from the Old Testament, people think we're Jews. So why don't you keep that? Now that conversation never happened as such, but the breaking apart of Christianity and Judaism changed the character of both. Great controversy has been saying that for years, but top historians are beginning to talk about it. A second historian I'll introduce you to is a man named Bart Ehrman. And Bart Ehrman wrote a book called Lost Christianities, you see a 
copy of it on the screen. And uh, the subtitle is The Battles for Scripture and the Faiths We Never Knew. Now, Bart Ehrman is no Seventh-day Adventist. In fact, he doesn't even claim to be a Christian. He was raised uh, a uh, Bible-believing church, uh, but today considers himself an agnostic at best. Interestingly, though, around the time this book came out, his graduate assistant was a student of mine, the Seventh-day Adventist. And when this book out, came out, I asked Carl, how much influence did you have with Ehrman when he wrote that book? And he said, none at all. I didn't know he was writing that book. He had me working on other projects. So Bart Ehrman, considered by many the leading historian of second, third, fourth century Christianity, has done this analysis, that in the beginning of the church, in the second century, in the third century, there were five or six different versions of Christianity. It's almost as though there were five or six denominations right from the start. And uh, only one of these became what we call Orthodox Christianity. Only one of these. And in fact, that wasn't the branch that Jesus' own family was part of. So Jesus' own descendants, you know, his nieces and nephews and so on, they did not follow the kind of Christianity that we understand today. And each of these branches of Christianity would point to the New Testament in support of their view. So when the New Testament came into existence, it was open enough that people could go in several directions in attempting to understand how Jesus would impact their lives. Then along came a fellow named Constantine. He was the Roman emperor who embraced Christianity in the first place. And uh, Constantine wanted to unite his empire. And he felt that Christianity would be the best way to do that. If people would become Christians, it would unite the empire. But the problem is, if the Christians are fighting among themselves, then they can't unify the empire. And so Constantine and others essentially destroyed these other versions of Christianity so that there would be only one orthodox Christianity, only one right-thinking Christianity. And every Christianity since then, according to Ehrman, has either been orthodox or against orthodoxy. The earlier versions of Christianity no longer exist. One of these, Ehrman points out, was Jewish Christianity. It was that branch of Christianity that was most closely connected with Judaism. It was accepted by Jesus' own family. They kept the Sabbath. They emphasized obedience. They emphasized the importance of the Old Testament for Christian faith. In other words, there was that branch of Christianity that didn't want to lose what the other Christians had lost when they broke away from Christianity. And Ehrman actually laments the loss of these earlier Christianities. He says, Christianity today is not what it could have been. So this early history, as I said, is sounding more and more like great controversy, which sees the triumphs of early Christianity not nearly so triumphal, but rather the subject of great losses. And Ehrman himself says there were consequences for the destruction of these other Christianities. One of them was the parting of the ways with Judaism, that Christianity and Judaism became extremely hostile toward each other, when actually they were cousins and uh, should have been able to get along. As a result, he says, Christians today tend to do narrow and selective readings of the New Testament reading those parts of the New Testament that fit our mindset and ignoring the rest. 
There's general ignorance of the Old Testament among most Christians today. Uh, would you recognize that? This is Ehrman, a non-Christian historian, talking. And he said that this diminishment of Christianity ultimately led to the rise of Islam. Because one of the things people don't realize, maybe many Muslims don't realize, is Muhammad didn't come to start a new religion. If you read the Quran carefully, you learn that Muhammad came in his mind to restore what was lost, to bring Judaism and Christianity back together into a new and, and higher form of faith. And because most people are unfamiliar with this, I want to share with you a, a number of passages from the Quran that will help us to understand this dynamic. One of these is the idea that the prophets of Judaism and Christianity are to be respected as equals. Now don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying the typical Muslim thinks this way or even knows about these passages, but they are there. And uh, that Judaism and Christianity were equals with Islam. Uh, notice this passage, and if you're at all familiar with the Quran, each of the chapters or surahs has a name and a number. And uh, the number there leads you into the right chapter, and then the second number is the verse where you can find this statement. And the statement says this, We believe in Allah and the revelation given to us and to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the descendants of Jacob, and that given to Moses and Jesus, and that given to all prophets from their Lord. We make no difference between one and another of them. This is not the language of somebody starting a totally new religion. It's someone who's deeply respectful of what God had done in the world before. We make no difference between one and another. We do not disrespect Moses, Abraham, Jesus, and so on. A second passage along the same lines. Those who deny Allah and his messengers, plural, and those who wish to separate Allah from his messengers, saying, we believe in some, but reject others. They are, in truth, unbelievers. In other words, if you claim to be a Muslim, but you don't believe in Jesus, you're an unbeliever. If you claim to follow Moses, or you claim not to, say, we have nothing to do with Moses, he's Jewish, you're an unbeliever. To those who believe in Allah and his messengers, plural, and make no distinction between any of the messengers, we will soon give their due rewards. Shocking statement, isn't it? But it's prominent uh, in the Quran. A second theme that you'll find in the Quran is that the scriptures of Judaism and Christianity are normative for the Muslim. The scriptures of Judaism and Christianity, notice Old and New Testament, are normative for the Muslim. In other words, the Muslim is supposed to accept these. It is Allah who sent down to thee step by step, in truth, the book. What's the book? Well, in this particular case, it's the Quran. This is the messages that came uh, to, to Muhammad. But notice what it says about the Quran, the book. Confirming what went before it. What went before it? The Old and New Testaments. And it clarifies, he sent down the law of Moses and the gospel of Jesus before this as a guide to mankind. So in other words, Muhammad was not trying to start a new religion, but to confirm 
the best of what went before, to heal some of the breaches that had come in Judaism and Christianity because of the battles through the centuries. A similar statement, if thou wert in doubt as to what we have revealed unto thee, this is God portrayed as speaking to Muhammad, if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed unto you, then ask those who have been reading the book from before thee. Here the book is all of God's revelation, especially the Old and New Testaments. If you're confused, Muhammad, about what I'm saying, then consult those who know the scriptures, because I've been uh, working with them for a long time. So the Bible, the scriptures of Judaism and Christianity are to be accepted by the Muslim. And then a third interesting idea that you will find is that Judaism and Christianity are valid expressions of Islam. Notice this statement. Say to the people of the book and to those who are unlearned. Now, people of the book is a common saying in the Quran for Jews and Christians, particularly Christians. Say to the people of the book and to those who are unlearned, do ye not also submit yourselves? That word submit is the word Islam. In other words, do you not uh, submit to God in the way that we do? If they do, they're in right guidance. But if they turn back, thy duty is to convey the message, and in Allah's sight are all his servants. You see that? Are all his servants. In other words, Judaism and Christianity is a valid expression of Islam. There's no forced conversion necessary. Now, as I said, that isn't necessarily the way Islam has practiced or understood through the ages, but we're going back to the founding text to understand historically what the dynamic was. One more. Had not Allah checked one set of people by means of another, there would have been pulled down monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques in which the name of Allah is commemorated in abundant measure. In other words, it's saying that genuine worship of God is taking place in churches, monasteries, synagogues, and mosques. In other words, the worship of God in Jewish and Christian contexts is as valid and is not to be uh, disrespected. So the mission that Muhammad came to this earth to present was not to start a new religion, but to heal some of the damage that had come before. Did it work? We know now, of course, it did not. Even within his lifetime came a serious breach between his new faith, Judaism, and Christianity. And that's a long history, and I won't get into it now. But at the end of all of that, you had a division among three monotheistic faiths. So there are three great religions that worship the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Moses. Three religions that all go back to that. The religions of Abraham, but they have separated and become hardened against each other. And each of them has lost something in part of that. So let me summarize something big here. Growing up as a Seventh-day Adventist, I was accustomed to asking the question, what's wrong with these other religions? That's an important question. And it's a question we can, of course, always ask ourselves as well. But what is wrong with these other religions? And one day I thought, well, what is right with them? If at any point God had been involved, was there something there of value that has continued? And so I asked the question, what are the core values of each of these three religions that have grown apart and become hostile to each other? What are the core values that each of them rejects? in the others. And when you go to Christianity, the core values of Christianity that the other two reject are gospel, grace, Jesus. 
these three tend to be looked at uh, with hostility by the others. Judaism, law, obedience, Sabbath are the three core values that Christianity and Islam tend to not get involved in. What are the core values of Islam? Submission, judgment, eschatology. What many people don't realize is that Islam is an eschatological religion. In other words, the core value of Islam is living your life in the light of the judgment. Living your life in the light of the end. And that was a shock to me because guess who else lives that way? Seventh-day Adventists. In fact, if you ask a Muslim, what does it mean to live your life in the light of the end? It says, well, if you come to the end of your life and look back, what do you wish your life had been? Will you, looking back, wish you had played more video games? Will you wish you had watched more television? Or would you wish you had put God first and done good things for other people? That's the Islamic answer. Living your life in the light of the end is that when you come to the end of your life, how will you wish you had lived? Live that way. What is the Seventh-day Adventist question? What is the one thing you take with you into eternity? Your character, right? Which is good works. At the core, asking the same question, giving roughly the same answer. So uh, Islam, I've learned, is an eschatological religion. And Christians and Jews tend not to be, on the whole, into that too much. So here's the situation. Three monotheistic religions, all of them grounded ultimately in Abraham and Moses and so on, yet hostile to each other, often fighting wars uh, against each other. Before we come to the conclusion, one more historian. It's a man named Philip Jenkins. And he wrote a book. He's probably the world's leading scholar of contemporary Christianity and history. And he wrote a book called The Next Christendom, The Coming, let's see, what does it say? The Coming of Global Christianity. Thank you. Some of you can see better than I can. <laughs> the Coming of Global Christianity. In other words, he has studied Christianity as a religion and is probably considered the leading thinker in the world. And the thesis that he has recently brought out in the next Christendom is the geographical movement of Christianity. He says Christianity is not static. It started out as an Eastern religion. The center of Christian faith was in uh, Israel, Egypt, Asia Minor. And then it moved to Europe, first to Rome, and then to Northern Europe, Germany, Scandinavia, England. And more recently, Christianity, the center of gravity is now in North America. And then he said, but it's shifting again. More and more, the weight of Christianity is moving south and east. And he said, so much is this the case that by 2050, the Anglican Church will have more members south of the equator than north of the equator. And I raised my hand. We were both speaking at the same conference, so it was okay. I raised my hand and said, it seems to me that if you had studied Seventh-day Adventists rather than Anglicans, you could have written your book 25 years earlier because we're already there. And he laughed and he says, I know. <laughs> he says, I know you guys. <laughs> he says, but I'm an Anglican, so this is, you know, this is my story, uh, et cetera. So uh, this geographical movement, I think we know it ourselves as we see the world changing, uh, that uh, Christianity is becoming more south and more east. In other words, it's returning to its roots. It started as an eastern religion. It's going back in that direction. And so 
he says, perhaps the great hope of Christianity is that it will restore that Eastern mentality that it had lost uh, through so many years in Europe and then North America. And then someone asked Jenkins the question, what book of the Bible do you think would be the most critical in holding the church together in this kind of a context? You know what he said? He said, the book of Revelation. He believed that the book of Revelation is the one thing that all could kind of gravitate to and provide a focus for the future of Christianity. And so my thoughts went to the book of Revelation. My thoughts went to the kinds of things we've been talking about the last three days. And my thoughts went to the message of the remnant that God placed inside that book. And we've been reviewing this over the last couple of days. The gospel, Daniel and Revelation, the heavenly sanctuary, keeping all God's commandments, warning of end time deception, relationship with Jesus, judgment, Sabbath. I invite you, take a close look at that list. Fix it in your mind, if you would, because I want you to see something that I came to see when I took a close look at this. Let's go back to the three-way division between Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Do you see what I see? Take a good look. It's the remnant of revelation. The message of the remnant contains the core values of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. If that is true, is that an accident? I don't think so. Apparently the great God, who in the book of Revelation cast a vision of the future, would know exactly what we would need when we get there. And one of the things that Muslims, Jews, and Christians seem to agree on is that one of the greatest tragedies of the world today is the hostility between faiths and the need for understanding and healing. And what I see here is that God has planted within the remnant message of revelation the very tools that are needed to reach out in all directions. There's something in this message for everyone. God knew what he was doing when he inspired John to write the book of Revelation. And you might ask yourself, what could we possibly have in common with Islam, for example? Well, let me tell you a story. About 25 years ago, I made my first visit to the Middle East. And uh, we got to stay in the Palestinian section of Jerusalem for about three months and uh, got to know some of our neighbors there. It was uh, fascinating uh, stuff there. And uh, at our first day tour, we had a group of pastors who were studying the New Testament in Jerusalem. What, a, what an incredible opportunity that was. And uh, the first time we had a field trip, a bus came to pick us up, and the driver was a Palestinian Muslim. And I sat in the jump seat, you know, as the leader of the tour, there's this jump seat right in the front that's sort of, you know, near the door, you know, and, and sitting near in close uh, connection with the driver. And all day we were talking. And all day we were interacting. And as we were on that long ride uphill to Jerusalem, at the end of the day we'd gone to Qumran, uh, we'd gone to Masada, we'd gone to Jericho, uh, we'd gone to the Dead Sea, 
So it was a great day. And as we were heading up the hill to Jerusalem, Jerusalem is one of the high points uh, in the land of Israel, he looked at me strangely. And then he said, you're an American, aren't you? And I said, yes. He said, how come you're not a Christian? Now, I was deeply offended. I said, what do you mean? I am a Christian. You know, that's who I am. There's no question about it. Oh, no, 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 no. He says, I know lots of Christians. You're no Christian. And I, I had this huge question mark. What on earth is he talking about? You know, this happened half a dozen times in the next couple of weeks. And suddenly I figured out what was happening here. He did not see in me a Seventh-day Adventist, someone who was a Christian in the sense that he knew Christians. He saw me more as someone on his side of the line, and I did not expect that. I was totally unprepared for that. Let me explain why. In the Middle East, there's clear lines of differentiation between Christians and Muslims. Everybody knows who the Christian is and who the Muslim is. How do they know? Uh, let's start with alcohol. If you go into a grocery store in Jerusalem and there's alcohol in the store, what do you know? It's a Christian store. If there's no alcohol, what do you know? It's a Muslim store. Where do Adventists fit? Uh, let's take a second one. Like I said, these, these differences are understood by everybody in the Middle East. Second, pork. If a person converts from Islam to Christianity, they will demonstrate that to their family by sitting down, drinking a glass of wine, and eating a piece of pork. And then his family will know he's gone over to the dark side, Christianity. Where do Adventists fit? You see where I'm going? I think there's something amazing that emerges here. Let's say you go into a travel agency in Jerusalem, and the women are dressed like Vogue magazine, you know, all the latest fashions. What do you know? It's a Christian or a Jewish travel agency. If the women are dressed modestly, it's a Muslim travel agency. Where do Adventists fit here? Or if you ask somebody in the Middle East what they think of the Pope, an Arab, what do they think of the Pope? If they're Christian, they say, this is great. This is God's person on earth. If it's a Muslim, it's a fairly hostile reaction. If you ask what a Christian thinks of America, they're usually very proud of their connection with this great Christian nation. You ask a Muslim what they think of America, not so happy about it. You see, in all the key differences between Christianity and Islam, Adventists appear on the Islamic side. Last thing I ever expected to discover. But what does that tell me? What does it tell you? For Christians to interact with Muslims is almost impossible. Because there's too many things that Christians do that are offensive to Muslims. Alcohol, pork, immodesty, glorifying smart bombs and, and everything else that America does. And what God has done is called together a people that is as Christian as anyone else in following Jesus, but nevertheless doesn't have the barriers to interaction that most Christians have with Muslims. And I've also learned as I've gotten a little older that Adventists who have worked in India often tell me that Adventism is closer to the native religions in India than it is to Christianity often. 
In other words, it seems if there is one faith that has the potential to connect with every other faith, it's a remnant of revelation. Loma Linda University is one of those places where the mission is an Adventist mission, but we have people of every faith committed to that vision, committed to that mission. It's a startling thing. It, it's a crazy thing, in a sense. How could this possibly work? And yet when the accrediting bodies came to Loma Linda uh, a while back, uh, they were talking to the students, you know, and what is the mission of Loma Linda University? And, and the students would answer, and it was, the answers were really too good. And so the accreditor said, wait, wait a minute, I know, this is an Adventist institution, all the Adventist students out of the room. We want to talk to everybody else and see how they fit. And when the Adventists had left the room, a Muslim got up and he said, what are you trying to do here? Are you trying to tell us we don't belong here? And he said, well, I'm not trying to tell you anything. I just want to know, what is the mission of Loma Linda University? And he said that Muslim student stated the mission with greater clarity than the president had. And we talked to other students of various faith back. They knew what the mission was. There's something about Adventism that can connect with people of every imaginable background. And to me, that raises possibilities that are so exciting. Again, this is my story. You know, if you don't buy any of this, that's okay. I was simply saying, how could the eschatological remnant arise in today's world? I've seen it happen in various places. I see it happening at Loma Linda University, where people of all these different backgrounds are working together on a common mission and feeling like they belong. That was shocking to discover. So that's my experience. That's my sense that God is willing to do something absolutely amazing if we are willing to let him. And if there's any value at all in what I'm sharing with you tonight, I think to me one of the great tragedies is just at the moment where we're beginning to catch a glimpse where other religions are catching a glimpse of what Adventism could mean in the world today, Adventists are buying into the hostility toward other religions more and more. At the very moment when this opportunity is opening up, many of us are closing our doors and saying, we don't want to have anything to do with others. I'm not talking about ecumenism here. Ecumenism is where institutions of religion unite together to increase their power or to increase their wealth, and that is never a blessing to religion. But what Ellen White told us from the beginning is that our mission is to make friends with kindred spirits in every imaginable place. The wealthy, the poor, the religious, the non-religious, the famous, the ordinary. The only way the gospel will go to the world is making friends with people who aren't like you. And what I want to encourage you tonight is you will find that there's something in Adventism that everyone can relate to. And how do you learn to do that? By doing it. Making friends, asking questions. I found with Muslims, you can make friends very easily if you don't present yourself as a Christian. Now I know that sounds like terrible heresy. But Christian in most parts of the world doesn't mean Seventh-day Adventist. Christian means the papacy. Christian means Sunday. Christian means alcohol and pork. In that context, when you say that you're a Christian, my bus driver friend, when I said I was a Christian, I was saying something in his mind that I am not. And so now what I do when a Muslim says, what is your religion? I say, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And they say, what is that? Well, uh, we believe in the judgment and the last day, and we don't drink alcohol or eat pork. 
And they say, brother, come on in. You're with, you're with us. You see? And, and now there's no barrier. You see? We've established what we have in common, and it's sweet, and it's beautiful, and the door is wide open. They're wide open to making friends. So I'd say, don't present yourself as a Christian. Present yourself as an Adventist, because Adventism as it is, uh, as one Muslim faculty member at Loma Linda said to me, he says, uh, Adventism of all the religions is the closest to Islam. He says, we Muslims all know that. An incredible opportunity. And I've seen similar connection with some of the other great non-Christian religions. So, is this God's plan? Is this the way it can happen? Can God use the Adventist message as a common ground that can be connected to just anybody from any background? If this is, in fact, the remnant message, it would be surprising if it wasn't so universal. Because the message of the remnant is to go to every nation, tribe, language, people, and I would suggest religion. In the past, we have tended to speak mainly to other Christians. And, and we haven't done a lot with the non-Christian religions. So what does God do? He brings them to us. They're here in Alberta. You'll see them in the you know, convenience store. You'll see them in the marketplace. You'll see them everywhere. They are here. And they're often eager to learn what makes Alberta special. I think God has given us an amazing opportunity. And if the only thing that comes out of tonight is you make one friend who's very different than you, that would be awesome. And you would be amazed. Um, you know, it, when you engage a Muslim, for example, the tendency will be to look for something to disagree about. That's what people do when they talk religion. So when a Muslim comes up to me and says, what do you believe about the Trinity? Well, I know if I start going on that, we're going to be arguing and shouting at each other within three minutes. That's an argument need that many religious people have. But you can turn it to a spiritual need very easily. And I will say, oh, that's an interesting topic. It would be fun to talk about that sometime. But right now, I'm more interested in something else. What does prayer mean to you? And a Muslim will be surprised because they don't think Christians pray. Why don't they think Christians pray? Because they never see us. They'll pray right in front of you with a carpet. And they're praying, it's time to pray, I'm praying right here in the, in the grocery store, right here in the mall, whatever, you see. They don't see us pray. That's the one thing I've learned there is that, hey, if I'm in a restaurant and the meal has arrived, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray out loud. I don't just want to pray, I want to be seen to be praying, you see. And so you ask a Muslim, what does prayer mean to you? And they're shocked because they didn't know you'd be interested. And they're excited because they can tell you what prayer means to them. And they're very hospitable. So when they're done, they will always say, and what does prayer mean to you? And the door is open to share your own walk with God, which will likely surprise and stun them and entice them. Wow, I wish I could talk to God like that. And now you've made a friend for life, you see? So I'd encourage you to think outside the box. And if you have a neighbor who's just totally different from you, say, this is God's doing. And we are going to find out what God will do in this amazing situation. To be an Adventist is both and. It's to be the bearers of a vital and unique message as we've seen, a divine calling and history. It's no reason for boasting or arrogance. We've seen that. God has called many people to various tasks. But to be called to this remnant message is a privilege and a responsibility. It's not a reason for boasting or arrogance. 
But most exciting of all, something big is coming. Don't you want to be part of it? Get on board. Tell the world. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I shared tonight a vision that I believe has come from you. But I say that tentatively because I realize we're not all wired the same way and, and perhaps I haven't explained it very helpfully. What I pray for tonight is that each person who heard this message would take away not what I said, but take away what you want them to take away, would make friends where you want them to make friends, will share their faith where you want them to share their faith, will find that sharing faith is not a burden or an obligation. Sharing faith is the coolest way to make friends when you learn how to do it. And I pray, Lord, that Alberta would more and more be seen as a shining light of what is coming and what could be as we align ourselves with the vision that God will bring us. Thank you, Lord, for the time we've had together. And I pray that today might be the first day of a renewed vision for the gospel here in Alberta. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, welcome everybody. We're back here. Uh, we have a new person here at the table. I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Pastor David Hamstra from the Evidence Central Seventh Avenue Church. And here we have uh, Pastor Cholo. Uh, uh, Sabatella, did I get it right? That's right, that's close enough. <laughs> close enough, Sab Sabatella? Uh, yes. Yeah, from yeah. Um, our church at Masquachis. Maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what you do there. That's right, so I am the pastor for the Masquachis. I like calling us a church family. And I'm also a chaplain at Mamawe Atascatan Native School. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, we got a lot of people uh, responding in the comments to your message tonight, John. It's really great. Uh, we we uh, it was very quiet in the studio tonight. We were listening intently. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I think uh, is going to be a very timely message for many of us. Um, well, we got some interesting sound coming into our studio here. And our tech just left. Hopefully that will be dealt with. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> moving right along. <laughs> Main takeaways from the message. Uh, I guess I'll get started. I mean, I, I think the core of your, your message was... Uh, one illustration of how the uh, remnant message of Revelation uh, can be a unifying factor among different religions, and you especially focused on the Abrahamic religions uh, that divided out within the, let's say, the first five centuries AD, more mm -hmm. or less, and uh, how the Seventh-day Adventist remnant message can sort of uh, bring those back together in a way that uh, I think many would find compelling. Um, I don't think we have time now to go into all the details you just covered, but Pastor Sholo, maybe you want to uh, highlight something there or bring out a different thought? Yes. Uh, what I really liked about this message, I think I've seen it on, gotten some ideas on YouTube because uh, I love your, 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 your understanding of Revelation. Uh, so what I like most is that it's challenging us as Adventists or as believers to think outside box to see how we are related to other people as, to, as all of us as children of God. So I truly appreciated that. Well, and then I want to ask you in return, mm -hmm. since uh, you have been working with Native Americans, uh, I, I was raising the possibility that God has designed the res remnant message in such a way as it can connect with all the different you know, people groups and religion groups, etc. Uh, in your experience with Native Canadians, mm -hmm. um, does, does this ring true there, or, or is there very little in common between Adventists and, and Natives? Yes, there is. There's a lot. We believe in, all, all of us believe in God as our creator, God as our healer, and you know the health message that we have. So that, mm. those are two main connections that we have as Adventists with uh, indigenous communities. You know, and this is a testimony I'm hearing around the world mm. that when, when Adventists embrace the spirit and the principle 
of a remnant faith. Uh, some of the details sometimes get you know lost in the shuffle, but when when the principle is embraced, uh, it always finds connection with people. For example, there's in New Zealand, there's a native people called the Maoris, yeah. mm -hmm. and they have a Sabbath tradition mm. of all things, just in their culture. It's mm -hmm. not a Christian culture, but there's a Sabbath tradition and several other things that only Adventists among Christians actually connect with them. Mm -hmm. So Adventists have. A, a way of, of reaching Maoris, for example, that uh, no other group in New Zealand does uh, quite the same. So I, I've had that experience here and there around the world, and it, it just suggests to me that this remnant message is not just connecting us with Jews and Muslims, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, is actually can connect us in more powerful ways around the world. I had a similar experience to you in the, in the broader scholarly community. Uh, there was an Adventist history conference I went to where there was a Jewish scholar presenting on Sabbath keeping movements in Africa mm -hmm. and that there are many peoples in Africa who see an affinity between their traditional customs and those of the Old Testament and are, are even to the place where they will think uh, that they are long lost tribes of the Jews. Mm -hmm. and whether this is the, in fact the case or not was not of interest to this particular scholar, but simply the fact that there's this affinity there and he's documenting this around the world. And I thought of a family friend who is from um, the northern part of India um, and the area around Nepal, who uh, confided in me a similar uh, suspicion. In many of the, the purity rituals that they observe are very close to the Old Testament. He wonders if there's any historical connection between his people and the Jews. And I, I put him in touch with this scholar, and the scholar told me, yeah, this is very interesting because now I am researching India as well and finding many of these connections in India. Mm -hmm. uh, so when the Seventh-day Adventists came to the community in northern India, Nepal area where this person is from, um, he, they were very receptive to our church's message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think there's, there's much work to be done in this field. Mm -hmm. Well, bringing full circle back to the first night, <clears throat> the sense that often we're losing connection with our young people. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think this understanding can restore a lot of that because there are aspects of Adventism that maybe the younger generation in North America doesn't connect with, mm -hmm. but when they realize that God has placed those things there to connect with other people, uh, they're very solid on diversity, for example, and, yes. and, and being... Uh, being fair and uh, respectful to all different cultures mm -hmm. and the realization that that Adventism may be as much as any other opportunity a chance to connect with all kinds of different people I think would be very attractive to the younger generation in North America. Yeah it is a challenge because I, I was thinking as you were presenting that many people of my generation this is the part of Seventh-day Adventism that they would struggle the most with mm -hmm. right why should I, uh, you know, observe these abstinences from various things that other people get seem to get along quite fine with? But mm -hmm. you know, we're seeing in the Bible that there's some indication we shouldn't be doing it. But how does this make sense? I, I think that's one way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I'm seeing among young people of of current generations is that they are in fact looking for rituals, uh, things that they can observe in their life that connect them to higher meaning, mm -hmm. and. Um, maybe looking closer to home might be a place to start mm -hmm. for such people. But Sholo, anything to add? Yeah, um, I think um, the, the fact that, um, I don't know, because I look at religion, uh, our church today, I don't think we're only just use, losing young people, but I think we're losing almost everybody, hmm. including the adults, right? It's just that most of the time we think that it's the youth, the, the emphasis has been on youth, but hmm. if you look, especially with the uh, all the COVID challenges and uh, the change that's been taking place, uh, it seems to me that we have lost uh, the essence of uh, how to relate our message to, with other people. Mm. Right? So we've been just um, feeding ourselves and feeding ourselves and that eventually it becomes irrelevant, just like the Dead Sea. right? So uh, I think um, bringing this aspect, it brings us back to the main reason why God has called the remnant to be in this place. So I, I truly appreciated that. So if we want to forge ahead, yeah. if, if we want to, to reach the place that God has envisioned uh, for us, we need to reconnect yeah. 
with the past, reconnect with the remnant message, mm -hmm. but to see it in the way that Muslims see it, yes. in, in the way that uh, some of the native Canadians might see it, mm -hmm. uh, the way maybe the Maoris see it. it. It is as we frame what we have learned from scripture in a new context, it often becomes more meaningful to us as well. Yes. Yeah. I've learned amazing things about Adventism from interacting with non-Christians. Mm -hmm. Because when I see what, what they care about and so on, and I say, no, wait a minute, we have resources that can be helpful here. Yes. But maybe like judgment is maybe an area we don't emphasize much anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, who wants to, you know, be sitting in front of the judgment these days? You see, mm -hmm. but when you realize that maybe the majority of people on earth uh, feel that the judgment is is an exciting thing to look forward to because if you've ever experienced injustice, yeah. mm -hmm. what do you need? Yeah. You right. need a judgment. Yeah. That's right. You, know, you need somebody to set things right. Mm -hmm. so the, while we've kind of shied away from that in the West in recent times, I think uh, if God put it there, it's going to be found worthwhile. So this is a, a, a direction I wanted to try to take this, and then I think we should probably get to some uh, YouTube comments at some point here. But mm -hmm. um, when you, we talk about all these all these connections that we have to other groups, and and how um, we really have a, a beautiful uh, sym symmetry to our message that branches out in all these directions. Um, and I think this goes along very well with what Ellen White says about not carrying the objectionable features of our faith at the front when we're dealing with people, right? Mm -hmm. Work with mm -hmm. them where, where we have that common ground. Yeah. But then how do we take the next step um, in, in, in bringing someone closer toward uh, the remnant trajectory that we see ourselves as being on, where they might have to give up some features of their current religious practice or mm -hmm. beliefs? Uh, um, you know, for example, uh, I think we can we can do a lot with the Quran when working with Muslims, but they have a whole other uh, tradition that they reckon with as well, mm -hmm. that uh, carries some things that are not so amenable to Seventh Day Adventism. So, wh what do you have to say about that next step in bridging those gaps? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, using Islam as an example, mm -hmm. uh, the Quran has proven to be quite an ambiguous book mm -hmm. in many ways. In fact, uh, in the third surah, the third main chapter, there's even a statement of the ambiguity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in this message. Yeah. And it's a deliberate ambiguity. And so Muslims have always argued as to how do you make sense of the ambiguity? How do you, how do you find the straight path? Right. Uh, and so they go to things like, well, it must be the companions of Muhammad after yes. he died. They're the ones that best understood us. We go with that. Yes. Uh, others have said the, uh, the hadith, the, or the traditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's yeah. where you go to make sense of the Quran. Others have said the scholars, you know, the Middle Ages, other, you know, the Wahhabis uh, mm -hmm. have their own way of reading it. Yes. So you have these different traditions. The Quran itself says, like we saw tonight, Mm -hmm. If you if you're confused about what this is all about, talk to those who had the book before you. Right. Wow. Go explore the old and the New Testament. That's where it'll come together. And I have found that when Muslims compare the Quran with the old and new testaments, the Quran becomes a different book. Mm. And it's a valid Islamic book still because it's the core document. Right. And it's being read in the light of its own principles of interpretation. Right. And so that insight has, has proven powerfully uh, impactful uh, among many Muslim groups. So, so I would simply say if you, if you want to make connections, uh, let's say you stumble into a Zoroastrian tomorrow. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have, okay. by the way, met a Zoroastrian. Yeah. Believe it or not. All right. You yeah. stumble into a Zoroastrian. You don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, ask a bunch of questions. Let them define their faith for you. Yeah. Yeah. And then go on the internet and find out more, etc. And then keep the conversation rolling. Mm -hmm. As you get to know where that faith is coming from, you will probably find some of these connections that we saw with Islam and with Judaism mm -hmm. also in these other faiths. And with Zoroastrianism, that's also an eschatological Absolutely. religion. Uh, with a cosmic conflict kind of a of an approach, so there's there's things there that we can talk about. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, asking questions, 
And uh, the beautiful thing about this generation is uh, questions, you often ask dumb questions or offensive questions, <laughs> but if you're honest and sincere and, and you're somebody that they like, they'll usually be quite forgiving, and that's how you learn. That's you, right. You just engage those people and learn how to talk to them. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a Sandra Willing who, uh, by the way, hi, Sandra. It's good to see you here. Mm -hmm. um, Sandra was a former church member of mine uh, way up in Peace River. Uh, she says she hasn't had enough time to get her comments typed in yet, so she's bringing in this one early. She says she was wondering about references um, to something big is coming, but she says tonight what you uh, tied it together really all made sense for her. And it opened up her mind to a new avenue of studying and thinking, and she, she thanks you very much. Mm -hmm. um, Wanda Johnson, uh, again, hi, Wanda. Uh, Wanda was my counselor at uh, Berman mm -hmm. University. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if she's still there, but she says she's been blessed by this. She had a Muslim say to her that Allah tells us to worship only one God, but you worship the Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, uh, this Muslim person told her that uh, she is wrong. How mm -hmm. would you respond to that? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned briefly uh, uh, coming through tonight, uh, you don't lead with the objectionable portions of your faith. And that's one way that Muslims will try to, to get the, the argument flowing and so forth. Yes. You're not going to change anybody's mind with discussion, with argument. Right. Mm. Uh, so what I did is always try to, to steer the discussion in a more spiritual tone. Right. And uh, one way to do that is to say, you know, that's an interesting question, but you know, that's kind of intellectual. Can we talk about prayer? Mm. Right. You know, something that's really practical, really meaningful, mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe we can find some common ground, you know? Right. And if a person simply wants to argue, then that's not a relationship probably that's gonna go anywhere. Um, I remember once uh, I was invited by a group with both Adventists and Muslims in it. Uh, it was in Europe, actually. And uh, they wanted me to just talk about, uh, you know, what are the positives between Adventists and Muslims? What can we learn from each other? Was that was the topic? And the party was crashed by a well-known Islamic apologist, who just tore into me and just laid out all the things that are wrong with Christianity, all the things about the Bible that he thinks are suspicious, etc. Sure. And I just sort of went silent. Mm -hmm. You know, I was not going to respond to that in kind. And finally, in the end, some of the Muslims says, well, we, we came to hear the professor talk, uh, you know, so what, what do you say to right. all mm -hmm. of this? And, uh, and I said, well, I, I find this conversation not heading in a valuable direction mm -hmm. because we came together to, to learn from each other and what we're yep. doing is pushing each other away. Mm -hmm. When the meeting was over, they banned the guy and said that uh, this is not the direction we want to go. We want to learn from each other. So I think the spirit in which you respond, mm. uh, if you truly love people the way Jesus said to love them, they will sense that. Mm. They will sense this is not a game. This is not a, you know, uh, we want to win over you. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to gotcha kind of a thing. This is not what this is about. This is about God and it's about relationship. And when all of that uh, is happening, it can change the dynamic. Beautiful. Yeah, mm -hmm. I always say whenever you argue with somebody, you give them a yeah. chance to reinforce their opinion to themselves. Yeah. And <laughs> so it's not very fruitful. But I suppose at some point you would need to address that, you know, the Quran's uh, critique of the Trinity has some challenges and, and issues that we mm -hmm. would say it's off base in that. But that would have to come much later. I think in well, a process, right? And as a starting point, uh, yeah. we both mm -hmm. acknowledge that Jesus was uh, from God. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Muslims even consider Jesus the perfect prophet. Right. Mm. You know. Yes. So we have we have a, a good solid starting point uh, right there. Yeah. And I think that uh, over time, as people sense a deeper and deeper spiritual need, yeah. their picture of God will grow yeah. mm -hmm. and their picture of Jesus will grow if Jesus is the one that is ministering to those needs. Amen. Yeah. This yeah. isn't something that happens overnight, yeah. Yeah. but with, with the right spirit and, and friendship, uh, God can do amazing things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. New experience prepares the way for a new answer. Mm -hmm. uh, Cholo, anything mm -hmm. else you wanted to throw in here? We have, I will say about five minutes left. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, we'll keep you a little longer tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so um, uh, one of the questions that I have, I've heard you talk about um, 
the, I don't know if you were ready to go into this, but the visible remnant uh, in some of the videos. Um, so how do you see uh, these three monotheistic uh, mm. uh, religions today? Do you see them as the visible remnant, all the three of them, or you see part of them as being the invisible remnant? Mm. Well, the eschatological remnant mm -hmm. is what God is going to do with every nation, tribe, language, people, and I believe religion. Right. That's right. And if that is the case, the scenario I see in Revelation mm -hmm. is that you have all these institutions of religion in the world, each of them founded to honor something they felt that God wanted them to do. So uh, if we believe in a great controversy, mm -hmm then that means that God is at work in every religion and Satan's at work yes. in every religion, just as God and Satan are at work in each of our hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, if that is the case, uh, then uh, I, I think, I'm afraid I'm losing my train of thought. Where did we start with this? I, I think the question had to do with the visible remnant. When and, does that yes. sort of appear, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yes. So the, the institutions of religion in the world, according to the scenario of Revelation as I understand it, mm -hmm. Babylon will be the institutions of religion mm -hmm. coming together for wealth and power right. and seeking to dominate, dominate. And the call, come out of her my people, will be not just to one or two religions as maybe mm -hmm. we've sometimes thought in the past, will be to every religion. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that uh, um, when we were having a dialogue with leaders of the Lutheran Church, there was a German scholar that broke down basically and cried. He says, you're telling me that I'm okay, you know, because I follow Jesus, but my grandchildren will be lost because they won't become Adventists. Mm. Mm. And he says, to me, this is despicable, etc. cetera. Mm. And uh, after a lot of back and forth and that, uh, what I said was, look, you worried about your grandchildren. I worry about my children. Mm. Right. I says, what Adventists believe is when the time comes, we're all gonna have to face that decision for mm. ourselves. Yeah. And at that time, our religious background is not what's gonna matter. What matters is if we're answering to what God is doing right now. Yeah. And so what exactly. I would understand the eschatological remnant is kindred spirits from every religion, mm -hmm. from every national background, finding each other and saying, we have more in common with each other than we do with our own homes yeah. uh, mm. of, of religion. And I've seen that happening in a number of places around the world where uh, I feel a deep kinship with people that I would never have imagined yeah. that could happen. But we have a common hunger for God That's right. and, and a common desire to get closer and closer to God mm -hmm. and uh, can help each other along that way. And in the end, uh, these kindred spirits you know, they may stay where they are for now, but in the end they will find each other. And that, I think, is the eschatological remnant. Mm -hmm. And I pray and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist institution will play a major role in that. Right. It's not guaranteed, remember? Yes. The it's temple, not the temple. <laughs> right. uh, there will be a thread between the historical remnant and the eschatological remnant. Mm -hmm. How thick that thread is is up to us. If we embrace the message and the mission that God placed among the remnant, uh, God can use us to do those things we saw in Isaiah, mm -hmm. you know, those, yeah. those amazing uh, stories there. Uh, if we choose to focus more on our little party, yes. et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, God may use somebody else. And uh, I, I'm concerned about that, but I, I genuinely believe that uh, we as an institution have the potential to be the catalyst for this great eschatological remnant. Mm -hmm. um, but the future is not yet written, and how God is going to do it is not yet written. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, we're at 9 o'clock, so I think we should wrap up. However, there is one question, which is, are your materials available at the ABC? How can people get uh, the Revelation series on CDs? Mm -hmm. I'm imagining you don't run our ABC, so you, you <laughs> wouldn't know the answer to that question. But mm -hmm. I would want to think that after you have presented all these things, our ABC would be carrying your materials and send them on our uh, uh, bookmobile truck mm -hmm. throughout the provinces, sure. and uh, you'd be able to pick it up there by God's mm -hmm. grace. Well, I did see this afternoon that at the camp right now are many copies of the video series that, that was referenced 
and also a number of copies of uh, two of my books on Revelation. Mm. Okay. And uh, so people who are interested in that may want to hurry over tomorrow and uh, take a look at those and then see if that's something you'd like to invest in. Fantastic. Mm. And as I mentioned, uh, check your local listings for when the bookmobile will be in or near your community. I would imagine those things should be on the truck as well uh, very shortly, if not already. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, uh, John, we just want to thank you so much uh, for coming up here to Alberta. Um, I hope you got to see a few of the sites while you were here. And uh, by God's grace, you'll have a safe travels home and uh, many more years of fruitful service in his mm -hmm. name. This has been a, a blessed experience for us. It's, it's been a very precious camp meeting and I'm grateful that we had a chance to be here. That's awesome. All right. God bless you all. Good night. Good, Good night. night. <laughs>